at a recent conference on Eurasian integration, Professor Griffiths was asked to address the question of how Russia's Eurasian Economic Union could be integrated with China's Belt and Road Initiative. However, he found that he could not answer this question without bringing other countries into the equation. I've called it who's playing in whose backyard because one of the nice concepts that was brought up when the Soviet Union was disintegrating was a concept of near abroad. And what we have here are a whole set of overlapping near abroads. Um, and so I've always thought that the question of BRI is bigger than China. The question of the Eurasian Economic Union is bigger than Russia and its partner states. And the European Union's interest doesn't stop at its borders either. That's fairly self-evident. So the project that I run is called the New Silk Roads and deliberately not called BRI or um, any of the other titles. Um, let's have a look briefly then at aligning uh, the Eurasian Economic Euro Union with uh, the Belt and Road. So how could you do it? Well, you could open the Eurasian Economic Union conditions to China. You could say, right, China trades with the other members of the Eurasian Economic Union on the same basis as everybody else. That, though, I think is unlikely to happen because China is basically more competitive and a more diverse economy and a larger economy. So it'll lead to a surge of import into the area that will displace Russian trade out of its trade block, certainly in Central Asia, that will be at the direct expense of Russia. And it will also be at the expense of the local economies that are just in no way equipped to trade with a large scale producer like China. So I don't see that actually happening in the short term. Um, so the other one is to open Russia to Belt and Road investments. Now, why not? The whole idea is building railways. China would love to build railways for you, power stations and everything else. But it wants usually sovereign loans. It wants the state to guarantee the loan, not a private partner. Private partner can always go bust and bankrupt. States are supposed not to. And it will give China more leverage with states if there ever are problems. And I think Russia is going to be very reluctant to take sovereign loans from China. And more, the other big point is China really ties its sovereign loans to Chinese contractors. You borrow from China, the Chinese do the job. And certainly I don't see Russia actually allowing that to happen. Um, so the chances of integrating the Eurasian Economic Union Belt and Road are linked, are harmed by these two basic problems. Russia cannot expose itself to Chinese imports on an unrestricted basis um, and doesn't wish to align itself with the BRI in a way that's acceptable to China. Nor should it have to, but it does limit the, the relationship. I've also said that the, the attitude is cautious on both sides. I think they're not quite as close as the propaganda from both sides suggests. Um, Russia is very cautious, I think, of Chinese influence in its near abroad. Um, with politics, with investment comes political influence. Um, the British have been shouting that since the 19th century. So whatever the intention of China, um, it's inevitable that its political influence will increase and that it will go at the cost of the position that Russia already has. Um, so at the moment, I think China finds Russia very useful in dealing with the United States. It's a good counterbalance um, in that. So there's a, this warmth comes as a reaction to uh, the United States. And Russia finds China comfortable because it's still got a political rift with uh, Europe on the, uh, yeah, the uh, poisonings in Salisbury, despite the beautiful cathedral there, um, and the shooting down of the, an airliner. Um, so that, those things are still there that, if you like, um, push these two countries, two countries together politically rather more than they're pulled together naturally from their own relationship. Now, bear that in mind when you look at the possibility with the European Union. You see, the European Union is basically fairly willing to have a free trade deal with China. Um, in fact, it's holding that deal hostage to the other side, and that is market access to the Chinese market. If you get this uh, 
market access agreement in China, if it's willing to open up its market to location, then that free, free trade deal is there. Now, also um, at this moment, negotiating a priority infrastructure alignment with the Belt and Road. Um, the Eastern Partnership countries that are sponsored by the European Union, the World Bank, include Belarus, include Ukraine, include Armenia, Moldova, the Caucasus, in fact, goes right the way through to the Caspian Sea. And together with uh, China, they're discussing um, infrastructure, what infrastructure can they agree on, what is the priority, and China has undertaken um, to be open in this. Now, those negotiations are still ongoing. What is interesting, though, is Russia is not in those negotiations. Um, you know, so it doesn't include going through Russia. So why are we all improving the infrastructure between China and Europe, ignoring a Russian contribution and ignoring a Russian alternative? So that's why I'm very insistent on bringing Europe into our discussion. Europe's also willing to take or separate uh, commercial considerations from politics. Um, okay, we have tensions on poisoning of spies. We have bigger tensions. Somebody has to say sorry at some time for that airliner. And until that happens, there is a political rift that lies there. On the other hand, Europe's quite happy to have um, pipelines being constructed um, that will bring uh, Russian uh, oil and gas or Russian gas to Europe, despite the opposition of the United States. It's happy to trade with China, despite all of the rhetoric of the United States of how that is wrong, predatory on the part of China. The problem, I think, that Europe's going to consider certainly as long as the Trump administration is there, is that the Americans are pressuring Europe to adopt a harder position, more in line with their own position on China and Iran. And that's going to mean yeah, towards sanctions or towards um, uh, investment stops and various other uh, forms of economic warfare. Europe is highly resistant to this European Union, but the problem there is there's only one country in the world that can offer Europe uh, security, and that's the United States. So at the moment, if Europe wants um, its security, wants to feel safe in this world, then it's the backing of the United States that guarantees that. If that gets watered down, or that's a link between NATO or American commitment to NATO and Europe's policies towards China and Iran, this open policy might change. So at the moment, Europe is resisting this. Um, I support that resistance, but it doesn't uh, solve the problem. And the other thing that's interesting is that Europe likes, as long as America is withdrawing from multilateralism, protesting against the WTO, taking away from climate change, China, ironically, is Europe's closest partner in discussions on the support of a multilateral uh, trading and institutional system in the world. So. If we're saying who is playing in whose backyard, it becomes much more complicated than just aligning China with uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Um, and it's even more complicated than these trilateral relations that I've been discussing here. Um, a lot, I think, depends on the next American elections and to how far this hardening of American position towards China and therefore implication towards Russia, how far that is now part of the national assumption of American foreign policy, regardless of whether the Democrats or the Republicans are in power. What we might find is the only thing that changes in November might be the rhetoric, but not the actual direction of policy. Mm -hmm.